Okay, so um, we have another session coming up with Alan Glicken, Glickenhaus. Glickenhaus. So Alan, Alan is a digital transformation and business strategist at IBM. Uh, Alan works with some of the world's most diverse businesses in bringing together their business strategy with their IT implementation to then enable transformation. Alan is also the author of over 150 papers, articles, and videos. So very excited to hear about Alan's talk and um, around overcoming the largest obstacles in digital transformation. And with that, I will hand over to Alan for 25 minutes talk and five minutes question time. Okay, am I ready to go here? All, all set. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Yoon. So I appreciate the introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. I wish I was there with you in Australia, one of my favorite places on the planet. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to traveling soon. So um, yeah, today's topic is overcoming the three largest obstacles to digital transformation. Um, and we'll get right into that. So Yoon already did my introduction, so we'll save a little time on this. Um, I do meet with a lot of businesses all over the world. Uh, all different industries, all different sizes. I do a lot of uh, individual discussions and and back in the old days of actually meeting at conferences, we'd have a lot of great chats there. Um, the papers and blogs and everything that you mentioned are categorized into these uh, areas that are listed at the bottom of this page. And the number next to that category is how many uh, items that there are in that uh, particular um, area that I've written. And at the end of this presentation, which we will make available to you, uh, I will have links to all of them. So if you are having trouble sleeping at night, I can solve your problems right away. Uh, there's 150 plus uh, things that you can uh, put yourself to sleep by. Today, we are just going to cover some of the things that I've written about across many of these different areas. So let's get into it. Um, so I'm the digital transformation and API business strategist for IBM. And when, when I took this role, I uh, said, well, I should really have a good understanding of what it means uh, to be to do a digital transformation. And so I, I had my own ideas, but I thought, well, I'll Google digital transformation and we'll see what uh, what everybody else says. And I, I encourage you to do that because what you're going to find is that there isn't one one definition. Um, there are hundreds or thousands. I didn't read them all, but lots and lots of different definitions for digital transformation. And I started to read through them and I get a kind of the, the feeling for what people were saying um, that they mean by digital transformation. And, and probably when I do meet with businesses, the first question I ask them is, what do you think digital transformation means? And so I'm going to cover this definition, which is on the screen. It's not one I made up. It's one from a company called the Agile Elephant. Um, and this is going to lead us into the three largest obstacles. So um, when, I, when I read the definitions for digital transformation, there's a group of them that fit into a category that's focused on technology, right? It's digital technologies, it's social, it's mobile, it's emerging technologies. If I just do that, I'm doing digital transformation. And, and that may be your definition. It, it, it's certainly one that many businesses think is digital transformation and, and that's their focus, right? So that's, that's one um, area of digital transformation. A second area that I see in the definitions is not only adding to the first definition, but not only the technology, but the encouragement of innovation and new business models. So we're not gonna just do what we did before. We're gonna innovate, we're gonna do new things, maybe new business models and, and try to you know, drive our business in, in other ways than we've done before. And, and again, great definition that many businesses are using. Uh, the third area, um, it, which I really didn't find in a lot of them, but I, to me, this is really what I think is the emphasis or should be the emphasis of digital transformation is to improve the experience of your customers, uh, whoever that may be. Your, your customers might be your employees, it might be your suppliers, partners, whatever they are, and, and taking things from their perspective and putting them in the center of, of the universe for digital transformation. So I like this definition because it covers all three of these areas. And, and so when we start to think about technology and business models and 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 you know, making the customer the, the center of the universe, um, that's, if we can do all that, then we're, we're really doing digital transformation. Now, around that, at this particular period of time in, in our lives, there are other things happening. A lot of businesses are moving to the cloud, uh, at least some of their assets to the cloud. 
Um, the last speaker was last question you just asked was about artificial intelligence. A lot of businesses are starting to think about uh, artificial intelligence and how they can take advantage of that. Uh, API economy, APIs have been around for a while now. And of course, a lot of this is building on top of, of APIs and also microservice architecture as a way to become more agile and, and do new things. And, and again, all of these are topics on, among themselves, but you, you marry this with the concept of digital transformation and all of this is something that is challenging businesses to move forward uh, at the same time. So the first obstacle that I wanna talk about is changing perspective. Uh, this is that focus on the customer. Uh, historically, what businesses have done is focus on what they do, right? I'm a bank, I do banking things. I'm a retailer, I do retail selling things, right? Uh, you know, I'm a auto manufacturer, I make cars. So that's, that's what I do and I focus on my things and people who want to deal with me uh, come to me and, and, I, I, and I offer what, you know, product or service that I offer to them. Um, as I mentioned in, in the last definition, Digital transformation, if you take the full definition, is changing that perspective from provider focused, what you do, to consumer focused, which is the first major obstacle. So we can't continue to do things as provider focused and, and be successful in, in, in driving to a consumer focused um, so, solution. And I'll get into that in a little more detail with some examples in the next few slides. But in order to achieve this, um, consumer focused change. This is a major change to the way the company is going to work. You can't just say, we're going to do a project now to, to focus on the customer and then go back to doing things we've always done before. So making digital transformation and this consumer focused approach, an executive and corporate priority has to you know, be the way we go, go forward in the marketplace from now forward. And, and that's a big hurdle to get over, right? So there has to be some real value in, in that. And there is, the, the revenue opportunities are extreme. And you, you can Google that as well and find out all the different estimates uh, that people are making. Uh, you also have to establish roles in both the business and IT that are gonna make this happen. It's not gonna happen again if people do what they did before, right? So we need to change some of the organizational structure and recognize that this is an ongoing journey, not, not a one-time project. So let, let's get into this uh, perspective thing in a little more detail, right? Um, our business has offerings. We uh, have maybe a physical presence of store of some sort, or maybe not. Maybe we just have a website and customers who want to come to us to get what we need, they come to our website, they come to our store, we sell them our goods. You know, if they, I'm a bank, you want a bank account, you come to me, I give you a bank account, right? You know, if you need a loan, I give you a loan, right? So, so you may search on the web for, you know, people where I can get loans and you'll find my business and all my competitors and you'll choose which one you choose to do business with. So we're reaching a set of customers that um, are looking for what we offer. But there may be a lot of other customers out there that we'd like to get our offerings in front of, but they're not looking specifically for a bank account or a loan. They're looking for something else. But as part of that something else, banking capabilities or retail or whatever industry you're in may be applicable, right? So let's say, for example, I want to buy a car or I want to buy a house. Um, I don't go to a bank to buy a car or a house. I, I, I you know, go to a real estate uh, agent for a house or an automotive dealership for a car. Uh, but as part of that, I often need a loan. So maybe I can do things with APIs uh, and events. We'll get into that a little bit later as well to create some partnering situations or third party apps or maybe social networks is another way to reach out and get our offerings in front of people who are doing other things, not necessarily doing a search for what banks or retailers or, you know, telephone companies or whatever you may be uh, are and, and getting a, a wider reach into the marketplace. And, and this is taking that customer perspective. So the customer is not looking for a bank. They're looking for a house. Um, and, and so I want to get myself in front of them and drive new business, new business models um, and a new perspective. And there are businesses doing this. So this is um, DBS in Singapore. Uh, and they have created multiple of these kinds of consumer oriented um, scenarios. And so this one on this page is specifically about home buying. And they've identified multiple different kinds of home buyers from the first timer, the upgrader, the investor and people like me, maybe no hair or silver hair um, and, and the kind of things that they need when they're moving. Right. So I need to find a house. I need to sell my house. I need to 
take care of the actual moving of my, my items from one house to another. I may want to establish a bank in my new location. I need to get insurance, on and on and on. You can think of all the things that go into a home buying experience. If I can make this a consumer oriented view that has all of these solutions in one place, then as a consumer, I'm extremely happy. I don't have to go search for these things from everybody. As a provider, I'm really happy as well because not only do pe I have to, um, I have my offerings, I'm getting them in front of people who would be, I'd normally be competing with them trying to put together their own solution, right? That they would get to the stage where they want to find insurance at their new location and they then start to look for that. If I put myself in this property marketplace, I'm an easy choice for them to make and, and get in. So this becomes a big opportunity if I can get to this consumer oriented um, orientation for my business to drive new business into my company. It's also probably the hardest thing that out of the three obstacles I'm going to tell you about today, um, changing the way your business works uh, it, and, you know, from a provider oriented to a consumer oriented is very challenging. And, and a lot of this comes down to just the inertia of the way your business has always done things before. The next thing I wanted to talk about is the new business models and innovation. And, and I'm going to give you just a few examples here. There, there are so many that, uh, that you know, there's no way I could be an exhaustive um, uh, discussion on this topic in, in the short time that we have together. Um, but, but let's just talk about business uh, as marketplaces as, as a, a new business model opportunity, right? So your business has customers and you know if they're good customers, big customers of yours, there may be a trust relationship between your business and, and their business. So I'll use banking again as an example. So if, if a customer um, of a commercial bank uh, is using commercial banking services, you do banking things for them. But they may need other services in addition to that. They don't only need banking for the things that they do. Maybe they're a retailer and they need to ship things to somebody. So, or you know, maybe they need uh, payroll or something like that. So, so there are other things that their company does. If you can provide a, a, a vetting and onboarding that you ch you check out and make sure that out of all the shippers in the world. We're going to pick some that are really reliable and, and high quality and that we would recommend for our trusted customers who trust us to use. And we can offer to put them into our marketplace. This is creating the kind of thing that DBS did. And, and similarly, I mentioned payroll is another one and whatever other API products other businesses are creating by putting them into this API marketplace and doing the work to vet, it, vet and onboard them. We're saving our customers the job of trying to find each one of these individually. Now, you're taking on a, a, an effort when you do that of establishing that these are, in fact, good providers of these services. And so as part of that, you may expect some kind of monetary compensation for that. Right. So you may uh, have money that flows into the marketplace um, and you may get a share of that. Then there's multiple different business models around that. You could charge these other businesses to be in your marketplace. Uh, you could charge them when they make a sale, a percentage of that marketplace, uh, or maybe you don't charge them at all uh, for being in the marketplace. But because there are so many good things in the marketplace, more businesses will want to come in and use it and you'll get more business for everybody. Right. So there's multiple different ways that this could work. Again, a longer discussion than I have time for here. But these are new business models that your business did not do before that generate new revenue for your company. So the previous speaker was speaking about API products and, and, and this is the kind of follow on to that, right? So, so many businesses when they start with APIs are thinking about the technology of APIs and using it for internal integration between their systems. And, and there's value in that. There's certainly, you know, there's some value, but it's not going to get you to the big money, you know, things that people are hoping to get from a digital transformation. And, and so moving up the ladder, you can get to where you're starting to treat your APIs as products that do things that provide value to these consumers. And many of the, you know, really, I don't know if digital transformation would be something that we're speaking about now, if we didn't get to the point where we had API capabilities that we can expose as products to enable these new business models and, and enable businesses to do new digital transformations. And so uh, APIs are a big part of digital transformation and, and you know, API products are, are really the only way you're gonna make that happen. It's just not gonna happen if you treat it as technology only. Uh, I have written one of the papers that I constantly am asked to speak about. I've done whole sessions here at API Days on this topic of monetization 
Um, and, and I encourage you to look at this, just not, not that um, you need to understand every one of the models. There's more than four. These are four categories um, that I've written about. And, and under each category, there are subcategories with models uh, and examples of, of businesses that are doing them. Um, and so many people focus on this developer pays model, the second column, where, where somebody is going to pay you to use your APIs. And it's a valid you know, model, but it's not the only one. Uh, more and more businesses do make money from APIs, which is the correct definition of monetization, not charging for APIs, but making money through the use of APIs by an indirect business model, uh, one that is not paying per API call, but rather paying because of the value that's provided uh, by the use of APIs or getting more customers through the use of APIs. And I could get into a lot of detail on this. Like I said, I've done whole sessions just on, on this one uh, con concept here that we're going to spend two minutes on. So, so monetization, lots of different business models, lots of opportunity for uh, business model changes for your, for your company, as well as innovation. So that's great. So we've got the first two obstacles out of the way, um, you know, changing our perspective to the customer, new business models, new innovation, and everybody wants to be successful with this. And 70% of the time it's not working. And, and the problem with that is that we've got a lot of stuff that we have to integrate. And so when you think about what I just described to you in the first two areas and that opening definition, we have a business that wants to do digital transformation. They want to do new innovative things. They're moving to the cloud. They're using AI. They're, they've got microservices. They've got APIs. Uh, so they've got things on the cloud. They've got things on premise. They've got things on somebody else's cloud. And they have a lot of microservices. And they got to make all that work together. And then you add on top of that this ecosystem thought of you know creating an ecosystem of, of people to solve a particular customer-oriented process. And they have the same thing going on. They're also trying to do a digital transformation, also trying to use AI and microservices and all that. That's a lot of things to make work together that that weren't initially planned to be working together. And so the need for integration is increasing like crazy. And if we don't address this issue, uh, we're not gonna be successful. And so this is the third obstacle to uh, success in digital transformation. And what we need to do is start to think about how can we do, we're calling it agile integration. How do I get the ability to have the integration that I need be done in a very quality oriented way but have more of it, right? So I, I need to start thinking about decentralizing uh, ownership, empowering teams to do things. Uh, we, we want to use our APIs and events and microservices as an architectural style, because that lets us do more fine-grained deployment and more scalability. And we wanna be able to boot, put this anywhere we want it. So if we want it on premise, that's great. If we want to tomorrow move it to Amazon or the next day to Google and the next day to IBM, you know, cloud, you can do it wherever you want to do it, or maybe multiple of those. Uh, I was speaking at an API days conference once and the person before me was, was saying how he was moving between clouds as each vendor gave him uh, offers for, for you know, a certain amount off if, if they move to their cloud and he took them up on that. So, so people are moving things to the clouds for any number of reasons and sometimes financially incented to do so. Um, so if you look at this historically, where we've been and where we're going, um, back 20 years ago, uh, there was this service-oriented architecture concept of a, an enterprise service bus. Everything went through there. Then we added a, a gateway for security in front of that. And you know, sometime after that, we said, well, okay, that's, that's good for internal integration, but not really easy for people to consume the, uh, the assets that we've created. And so we started to think about APIs as a way to socialize the capabilities that we had and make them available. But again, it was kind of a centralized thought. The cloud hadn't really taken hold yet and not, if anything, not much was in the cloud. As we started to move to the cloud and we started to move toward microservices, we started to think about putting microservice applications in the cloud. And, and then the issue became, how do I connect that thing in the cloud to another thing, maybe in a different cloud, but also on premise without having to make a trip that says, okay, to call the other thing, I have to come back on premise, go through a gateway, go through a connectivity layer, and then go back out to another cloud where I go through another security layer. It's just crazy, right? I, it, it just take too long and, and too much um, has to go right. For, for that to, to, to be successful. And I'm 
really bottlenecking everything through a single centralized infrastructure and a centralized team. So we need to move things out to a decentralized environment where not only is the application uh, microservice architected, but the integration and the APIs are microservice architected. And so that anything I want to do can be put anywhere I want it to be. And, and so I can put the APIs and the integration into the clouds where they need to be as well. So very important to the success of this is to differentiate between what's an API and what's behind the API. And, and I have a lot of discussions about this with businesses who kind of blend this all together. And, and really, they're doing themselves a, a disservice when they do that. So think about, you know, from the integration down um, as what you do in your company. This is the making your systems work with each other. Um, you know, all those backend integrations, often very complicated interfaces, um, provider oriented kinds of things that we've been doing for years. Um, and now how do I expose that in a consumer oriented fashion, securing it, controlling the access to it, getting the logging and, and, and the analytics from it? That's the API layer, right? So it sits on top of that. And, and having you know, many APIs that uh, expose different perspectives on the back end is good. Um, we don't want to have uh, runaway uh, copies of, of, um, of you know, master data, but we do have the ability to have multiple views of that master data. And, and that's where APIs uh, come in. So differentiate the API from the back end. Now, when you're thinking about deployment, start to think about how you split, how you organize your business into probably logical lines of business or geographic uh, entities or something like that, and, and how those domains are going to work. Maybe it's even different clouds that you want to put things on. And then start to think about the non-functional requirements of the different things that you're going to put there. So the, the applications and the integration uh, capabilities and how much they're going to need to scale up and so on and then deploy the, the integrations uh, appropriately. So, you know, one of the things that, that you can't have happen is bottleneck on certain version levels of your integration software or your API management software. Um, if, if you have everything running on version three today and you need to move to version four, then having to test everything that is gonna work on version four when you've got hundreds or thousands of items is just unmanageable. But if I can start to put some things out that need the capabilities of version four into their domain and then migrate the others over time, it's a much more doable uh, thing. So, so think about integrations as you do with applications um, as individually deployable components. Now, in addition to APIs, um, and, and you know, we're often starting to think about APIs not in the traditional technology sense of REST or maybe sometimes SOAP, but other technologies as well. And, and so if we step away from, from APIs as technology and into APIs as a concept that we want to manage and allow information to be provided to different applications that need it, whether those are internal or external, uh, we can start to think about events as another form of, of API. And so, Traditional APIs have been request response. You make a request for some information, it comes through the gateway, it does things on the back end and gives you back a response and it's it's real time. And maybe you'll cache some things to, you know, that are, are frequently used to, to speed that up. Um, with events, we can handle the event by pushing the information to the application that needs it when they subscribe to that information and th then take away some of the, uh, the uh, the scalability needs or the, the performance bottlenecks that we would be creating on the back end. So events and APIs together provide a very good uh, solution where you have some things that need a, a, a real time look up in the back end and other things that as they change, I can push that information out like inventory levels, right? So once I have a new inventory level, I can push that out to anybody that cares about that particular item. And, and now the next time they need to get the inventory, I don't have a thousand queries for everybody's, uh, how much inventory do we have on this particular item? They all can get it by looking in their own local uh, definition of that in the event. So let me, um, let me wrap this up here. Um, the solving the integration challenge is the third challenge, right? And the need for integration is increasing. The need to scale the ability to deliver quality integration is, is increasing. 
And so how do you do that? We, you know, there are certain things that, that are, are, are very challenging to do. And I'm not saying that we're going to do every integration with a decentralized team, but we need to be able to expand the number of developers who can implement integration tasks and maintain that quality. And so we need to be able to automate integrations, use artificial intelligence as a way of capturing the best practices around uh, integration and leverage these best practices as built in um, assets within the integrations that allow people with not as much skills in the area of integration to do things in an automated and assisted way so that we are leading them down the path of success for integration. And through the area of automation and AI is really the best way to solve this integration challenge. So that's been our focus in IBM and it's what we're working on. We um, have a product called the Cloud Pack for Integration. It has lots of capabilities in it from API management to events, to application integration for the, the internal integration, the security and on and on and on. And all of that is based on a set of capabilities under, underlying that for artificial intelligence and automation. I'm not doing a product pitch here, um, but if you want to find out more about this, you know, go to our website on Cloud Pack for Integration and you can find uh, out much more about, uh, about how we're doing this. Um, this is really uh, what we're thinking is going to provide the capability for you to deploy what you need to deploy where you need to deploy it. It can run, it is a set of microservices. It runs as a set of microservices and runs on any cloud you want it to run on, um, as you see on the bottom of the page. So that's uh, that's it. We're going to just wrap up here. Uh, you know, the three obstacles were changing your uh, perspective from uh, provider to consumer, um, having the ability to introduce new business models and innovation, and getting your integration strategy uh, fixed up so that you can meet these goals. And so in order to do that, um, it's not just going to be something we can do in IT. We have to get the executives of the company and the business to back this. Um, we also need to establish what we're really trying to achieve, right? So what is your definition for digital transformation and what are the goals that you want to accomplish for that? Um, funding, roles and responsibilities, uh, resources. These are other things that you'll find in my writings, which I'll point you to in a second. And uh, lastly, this has got to be constantly communicated. All the different levels of communication from executives to the developers, to the offerings that you make to the world um, need to be evangelized so that people understand what you're doing and are moving in the same direction. So I'm going to just wrap up here, just pointing you to these links at the end of the uh, presentation. When you get this deck, um, this is a, a, I wrote an article for an external uh, magazine on, on this particular topic. So you can go right there. Uh, there's three pages of links here um, into these different categories that I mentioned at the beginning. If I write something tomorrow, it's not going to be in the links that I provide you today. So this link at the top of the page will get you to everything that I write. So it just changed the year to the number for the year and you'll get uh, whatever things I've written in that year. Um, not as well organized into the categories as this is. So page one here, you have some just basics. If you need to train somebody or you know, have them help understand what is an API, what is the API economy, basic kinds of things in, in, in that area. Digital business, digital transformation, digital ecosystems, um, all these kinds of things are in, in the second column. Next page, business and value, monetization, marketplaces, platforms, ecosystems, uh, lots of content uh, about that in that column. The second column on this page is my strategy, governance and best practices column, beginning to end you know, all the steps that I could think of for creating an API strategy down to measuring and, and, and making that successful. And uh, third page, last page, something on architecture and technology. Um, there's a good paper toward the bottom of the page here on security. I recommend that one. And then the, the right column is frequently asked questions, uh, not frequently, it's industry related. So uh, all different um, industries and use cases, just sample introductory use cases for every industry that I could think of. So that's it. Yoon, I'm done. I think I'm 25 minutes into this, so we should have some time for questions.
Awesome. Um, well, that was a lot of content. That was the action pass session. Then uh, I can see there's a recurring theme around that top down executive buying and the bottom mm -hmm. up and that whole API ecosystem. But unfortunately, we are out of time. Yeah. And um, <laughs> Alan, we uh, will be available to answer any questions either in the stage chat or in the event chat. Um, I think a lot of that kind of API ecosystem and marketplace really resonate with the current push for open banking in a lot of parts of the world as well. I think definitely a very interesting topic, um, but we will have to move on, unfortunately. And thank you for your time, Alan. That You're was uh, very thought-provoking. Yeah.